floor is yours. Uh, okay, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. It's very uh, nice uh, to uh, to make this meeting, albeit uh, virtual. Uh, so, uh, as we preliminarily agreed, we are talking. Uh, uh, we are going to talk about the um, uh, not only the place of Armenian, as you mentioned, uh, Hamidjan, but uh, in general, right? So this was one of the uh, the issues. So we are going to talk about the origin of the Armenian language, about its uh, Indo-European origins, uh, and about the highlights of the methodology. How to uh, how do we know about this? And uh, because um, I suppose that uh, the audience is uh, consisting of uh, mainly of people who are familiar with linguistics, right? Uh, not historical linguistics per se, but uh, in general, uh, you are, uh, if I remember correctly, philologists or uh, linguists. And so uh, I will try, of course, to um, to be, to talk uh, in a popular language, but uh, not too simplifying because you are uh, close to the field of linguistics, right? Uh, so, First of all, let's have a look uh, at the spread of the Armenian language domain uh, within the historical uh, map. So this is the historical map of um, uh, the Ar historical Armenia. Uh, so you can see here the borders, the rivers, Arax, uh, Akhurian and Araxes. Uh, which uh, which is the, which are the borders of uh, contemporary Republic of Armenia? Uh, I hope you can follow um, my cursor, right? Uh, sorry if uh, sometimes I will be speaking uh, about uh, very elementary things, but uh, just because I, I'm not sure about the coverage of uh, my audience, uh, just very briefly I will mention some elementary things and then we will uh, proceed. Uh, so uh, this much is the Republic of Armenia, but of course, um, in historical times, uh, starting with um, coverage of uh, Ar purely Armenian sources, starting from 5th century uh, of Anno Domini, but also 1,000 years before that, starting with uh, Herodotus, Xenophon, uh, Strabo, uh, etc., Plinius, and many others. Um, Non-Armenian, that is uh, ancient, so-called antique um, hist historiographers. Uh, the, their testimony uh, largely coincides with the um, testimony of uh, purely uh, Armenian historiography uh, from the fifth century AD. So, from fifth century BC and from fifth century AD, we um, roughly have uh, the same historical um, territory about which we are going to talk. Actually, we are uh, concentrating ourselves on the Armenian language, of course. And um, let's start with the invention of the Armenian alphabet. So it's the beginning of uh, fifth century, um, common era or and, and, uh, domini, whatever you prefer. Uh, so uh, the Armenian alphabet consists of 36 original letters. Uh, the, the original form of the script was called Yerkatagir. There are debates about the uh, reason of uh, why it is called this way, but we are not going to concentrate on this, of course. Uh, and um, Armenian literary tradition is divided into three major uh, strata uh, stages. One, the first one is called classical or grappar. Grappar literary means um, written way, that is the written language. Uh, then starting from the seven, uh, 12th century, we have Middle Armenian and then Modern Armenian, or uh, we call it Ashkarabar. Uh, literally, it means secular language. So fifth century is regarded as a Voske Darian period, that is golden age of Armenian lit literature. Uh, this is how uh, the Armenian alphabet looks like. Uh, as I said, uh, it consists of 36 original letters. Uh, they are originals, um, they are original letters uh, as far as uh, their shape is concerned. Um, but of course, syntagmatically and uh, historically, contextually, uh, it follows the Greek uh, original, Greek prototype, because in fact, this is an early Christian 
uh, cultural phenomenon, right? So you can see the sequence of the letters. So here, uh, the, the first columns, you see uh, the purely native Armenian writing ways of the characters, capitals and minuscules. Then third column presents transliteration. Then we have the names of the Armenian letters written in both Armenian and in transliteration. And the last column, so here and here, uh, we have in red uh, Greek counterparts of the Armenian characters. Of course, the Armenian phonemic invent, uh, inventory is richer than the, uh, the Greek one. Uh, that's why uh, here and there you, you have uh, here empty uh, places because there is no, uh, the, in those cases, there are no uh, Greek matching phonemes. Uh, so this is the Armenian alphabet, and uh, ma minor uh, ch changes occurred in uh, during the uh, centuries. Uh, starting with 11th century, uh, we have also addition of O and F. Uh, but uh, so this is it. Uh, now uh, I presented uh, Armenian alphabet reorganized into tens. Uh, because in ancient times, uh, the characters also served uh, for ciphers, to, to represent also ciphers. So from A to 9, we can see the numerals from 1 to 9, from the letters A to T, to. And then starting with 10, with the letter J, we have tens. Then we have hundreds and thousands. So suppose uh, an, an author wants to say that um, there were 1,111 soldiers. Then he says he writes R -j -j -a soldiers. That is uh, 1,111. Okay, uh, some very brief uh, mentions of. Uh, Older ways of older representatives of uh, Armenian script, uh, because uh, the majority of the manuscripts um, have survived only through copies. So this is the case with many other traditions, also, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, the physical, from physical evidence, we just mentioned a couple of uh, examples, like uh, on the Tekor uh, Monastery, which is uh, nowadays in the territory of Turkey. On the right, uh, on the eastern uh, shore of uh, the river uh, Araxes. So we see here the fifth century, a wonderful uh, inscription. Unfortunately, now it's gone because the uh, monastery is almost uh, destroyed, and uh, we have only um, some pictures, photographs. Then we have uh, this mosaic in uh, Jerusalem, which is also very old, uh, and some. Uh, seventh century, there are also some uh, earlier or later Yerkatagir, um, uh, that is only capitals. Uh, so these are samples of um, the old Armenian script on, the, on some churches. Uh, and uh, there are excerpts from um, old manuscripts, only with capitals again, Yerkatagir, iron script. And then we have um, relatively younger, which has both majuscules and minuscules. So a couple of pictures, how they look like. And uh, sometimes uh, the manuscripts start with the illustration concerning to the themes of the uh, manuscript uh, itself of the text. Uh, okay, this much about the um, uh, very general, very rough introduction about the Armenian uh, um, script. Uh, now about uh, the Armenian language, uh, very general things about um, how do we uh, compare languages. To start with a very familiar language such as English. So um, we see, for example, the, water, uh, the word for water and we see how it is spelled. It is pronounced differently, of course, because uh, the every uh, year, every uh, decade every century language changes it so it changes constantly any language changes uh, all the time 
so now we pronounce water, but uh, the exact form is water, water of course. And uh, historically, it was non aspirated, just the water, uh, as modern day Dutch say, water. So here we have still the original pronunciation. And German way is Wasser with SZ. And uh, I introduced here another simple example, which shows not only this, the same phonological uh, correspondence, but also similarity of uh, grammatical structure. So we, this is very lucid and very uh, transparent one. So I have eaten, ich heb gegeten, we pronounce gegeten, but of course it is gegeten, and in German, ich habe gegessen. Why I uh, show this very elementary simple things, just to make sure that uh, we are going to talk about the phonological uh, sound laws and this, any sound law should be systematic. This means that if within certain uh, phonemic environment, this old prototype of old uh, phoneme behaves this way, then this means that uh, if we are treating this as a, a scientifically proven, methodologically uh, justified, uh, phonological rule, then this must be observed also in all the other similar instances. So between vowels, if the old T behaves this way in Dutch and in English, and in German it is SZ, which was a bit complicated sound earlier, then it should be observed also in other cases. And this is the case uh, in the second example. These examples are many, really, really many, and they just show that, uh, uh, again, we are dealing with the phonological rule. Now, um, I want to introduce an example, um, uh, tens or hundreds of uh, which, which kind of uh, comparisons uh, demonstrate that Armenian is really an Indo-European uh, language. And uh, I just want to make sure, um, what do you mean by saying that Armenian is an Indo-European language? This means that uh, Armenian is descended from a proto-language, which we conventionally call proto-Armenian, yes, uh, excuse me, a proto-Indo-European language family, because all the languages are divided into language families, uh, as you, uh, I'm sure, uh, know. Uh, there are really many um, different language families. There are three Caucasian languages, uh, Georgian, uh, Lesgi, and um, uh, Avar, Abkhaz, and many, many others belong to one of these Caucasian languages. Uh, Turkish is, of course, with the uh, Turkic language family. Uh, we have uh, Kamchatka, Yeniseyan, we have uh, Afroasiatic or semito kamitic uh, and Atabascan, uh, Suaheli, Bantu, et Dravidian, etc., etc. Many, many language families, each of which is consisting of uh, tens of sometimes even hundreds of languages. Uh, because uh, on the planet Earth, uh, not a single language is isolated. Every language starts from somewhere and, and it develops always. And if we uh, consider an historical stage of this language, then it should have also its uh, ancestors, ancestral forms, uh, whether or not we can trace it, whether or not it, it is attested in uh, historical documents. But in any case, all languages had their ancestors and they belonged once to some um, family. Uh, nowadays, we have some languages which are totally isolated, like Basque, for example, you know, in the territory of uh, Spain, or Sumerian, uh, or Ainu in Japan, many such isolated languages. Uh, but uh, this is not to say that they are really isolated, uh, but only that we don't know anything about their history. So by chance, uh, no relatives of these languages have survived. For this reason, we don't know much about their uh, sister or brother languages and about their ancestors. So this is the only thing, uh, how, why uh, do we have isolated languages? Actually, uh, there are no really isolated languages, but only our knowledge is limited. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So this is one example which shows impeccable appurtenance of the Armenian language to Indo-European language family. So you see, uh, in a moment, we are going to see the uh, spread, the map of the spread, uh, spread of Indo-European languages. And we can see that uh, how um, huge territory covers this, starting with uh, Scandinavia or Pyrenean uh, Peninsula, and also Asia Minor um, Peninsula to almost to the territory of China, where we have Turfan, where we, where we have some Iranian and Tokelian languages, and all of them being uh, Indo-European, of Indo-European origins. So here we can see Luvian word for daughter, Tukvatrai, and Hittite also. Tokelian, Tkatser, or Tkatr, genitive. Sanskrit, Duhitar, which comes from Dukhitar. Avestan, which is the oldest attested Iranian language. Actually, it belongs to East Iranian uh, sub-branch. Uh, Dukhtar. Re in recent uh, periods, we have um, certain very plain development from Gede to Khata, so Dukhtar. Many of you, I'm sure, knows, uh, know uh, Persian word for daughter, Dukhtar. Then Greek, Thugater, Armenian, Duster, genitive, Duster. Gaulish, Celtiberian, etc. So these are Celtic or Celtic languages. Uh, so you see again, Tuchtir, Tuvateros, Gothic, Dautar, German, Tochters, English, Doctors, etc. Uh, Old Prussian, Dukti, Lithuanian, uh, Dukte, Russian, Dutch, Dutchers, etc. etc. All of them mean daughter, and there can be no single chance for. Uh, accidental resemblance. So uh, let's look at the coverage of Indo-European languages. So all the languages written by black characters are Indo-European. Of course, several thousand years ago, uh, they were not widespread throughout all this territory. Uh, there was somewhere a pro the uh, proto homeland, the so-called Heimat, as Germans say, or in English, homeland. Uh, so there are, so, so we will come to this issue, of course. Uh, there is a lot of um, discussion, debate uh, about the location of the original uh, homeland. Uh, there are theory, uh, theories which say that uh, the homeland was um, in this Kurgan, Yamnaya, uh, or Srednistok cultural uh, areas or it is here in Armenian highlands or largely spoken in the, uh, Asia, minor or uh, Middle East. Uh, there is this Balkan theory, uh, North European theory, etc. cetera. Uh, again, we'll come to this point. So um, I just want to make sure that we, we are not confused with the fact that uh, there are so many Indo-European languages in throughout the Eurasia. Of course, this spread was in historical and prehistorical and historical different periods. But originally, there, there must have been uh, an original locus, an original homeland somewhere, most probably here. Uh, in earlier times, probably also here. Then there was this double migration, as modern theorists say. Uh, and uh, during millennia, we get this variegated uh, picture. So finding uh, Indo-European languages as far back as uh, Indo-Iranian uh, in the territory of uh, Indostan uh, Peninsula, or uh, Tokelian, uh, very close to Turfan, that is uh, already almost China, uh, and uh, Scandinavian Peninsula, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And with other colors, of course, I mentioned uh, the other language families. So we go on with um, other lexical examples, you see the first one is uh, the words for name. There are more than tens of Indo-European branches which have the same word with the same meaning and the form. But of course, just to keep it simple, uh, as I mentioned only uh, some of them. The second is the word for star. You see, astel, aster, Greek, uh, stella in Latin, styrno in Gothic, 
star in Germanic, largely Gothic also belongs to it, of course, Hittite, Hasterz, etc. Then the word for door, Durn, Duar, Tura, Foris, Dor, English Dor, uh, Dvers in Old Church Slavonic, this OCS means Old Church Slavonic, etc. Duster in Armenian, daughter, we, we already saw this, this one, of course, Duhitar, Dugater, etc. Please keep, uh, um, pay attention to the fact that uh, all the correspondences, uh, for example, to the stop, to the consonants are regular. For instance, if we have the, then the corresponding phoneme in other languages would be also the, but in Greek it is t, so it, lost its voice. And this is systematical because uh, we can see it not only in Tugater, in daughter word, but also in uh, door word, in Tura. So that's why we are saying that we are dealing with phonological rule and methodologically justify these rules because, so it's only two examples here, but uh, if we would have a uh, um, complete, uh, complete course, then we could see tens and hundreds of such uh, phonological correspondences, and these are totally regular. So one example, a bit uh, thorough, uh, more thoroughware, Sanskrit matar, which means mother, Greek mater, the same thing, Armenian mair. So you see there is an Armen uh, Armenian sound law, according to which intervocalic t disappears. D this happens also in brother, word and the word for father and uh, in many other words. So this is phonological rule because uh, during millennia, phonological changes always happen and every language has its own root. Uh, and uh, because as I said again, uh, any language develops always. Uh, there is not a single language on the planet earth which stays archaically as it, it was from the beginning. So there is no such a thing as a beginning of a language, of a particular uh, language in contemporary terms, of course. So you see Latin mater, Old High German mother, English mother, Tokedian, uh, Tokedian is again in Turfan, uh, China. So can you imagine from that area to Europe, etc. Russian mats, materi, genitive, the air again showing this part, etc. Uh, and uh, this is the word for name. Uh, so you can see Armenian, Greek, Sanskrit, um, Latin, Gothic, Hittite, etc., etc. Uh, and to one thing is very important: uh, all these languages and all these forms are attested in all these layers of these languages. So if we are talking about Hittite, then this means that these words are uh, related, uh, are um, attested uh, in historical sources coming from uh, 16 or, seven, uh, or 15 centuries before common era. So that is more than uh, 35 centuries before, three and uh, 3,600 or more years ago. And uh, Gothic is uh, the oldest language of uh, Germanic. Uh, Greek also more than three millennia, if we account also uh, Mycenaean period. Uh, so in, in Indic and uh, Iranian uh, branches are, are also very ancient as far as the um, script is concerned. Attestations, I mean, because of course, the, uh, all the languages um, existed also before the invention of their uh, scripts, right? Uh, but now we are talking about their um, uh, fixation uh, through the time, that is historical documentation. So all these words also, hundreds of such uh, Indo-European uh, words are attested in the, in the oldest periods of all, the, all these Indo-European languages. And uh, these words belong to the basic vocabulary. Uh, so you, you can see name, uh, son, um, numerals, uh, pronouns, um, a boy, man, a wife, uh, evening, morning, etc., etc., etc. All these words are non-technical, non-recent um, uh, uh, terms, but they are basic. They are 
most conservative items. And again, they are also attested in uh, the oldest uh, historical stages of these languages. So this means that if we again come to the uh, map of Eurasia, uh, we can imagine that there cannot be any single uh, accidental resemblance uh, within uh, within this large Euro uh, Eurasian area, and also so systematical between uh, more than thousand routes. Actually, Indo-European routes are more than thousands, and uh, many hundreds of them are represented in all the Indo-European languages. So this is why we uh, we cannot doubt the Indo-European origin, of course, uh, and. Um, we have to uh, systematize all our knowledge of historical phonology or morphology of any language from this starting point. So you can see here uh, in the European phon phonemic inventory in these uh, three columns and their Armenian re uh, reflections depending on the um, position of the phoneme within a word. Of course, we are not going to discuss this, so it's uh, tiring. This is a specific issue. Uh, this is just development of uh, Indo-European phonemic, uh, that is stop system into different Indo-European languages, only five of them. Uh, so again, we go on. Uh, so at the last uh, point of this introductory part, uh, I want to uh, present some morphological examples so that we can see that uh, this relationship is really very, very deep. It doesn't concern only with the um, vocabulary items, but also uh, phonemic, uh, excuse me, uh, also morphological, that is grammatical inventories, that is case endings, uh, verbal endings, etc. So. Uh, for example, first person um, indicative present ending being me, et cetera, et cetera. So because this is very deep into the language start, uh, structure and origin, and uh, this uh, tells something uh, even uh, deeper and even more serious than the vocabulary. Of course, basic vocabulary is also very important. And we saw that uh, it's the basic core belongs to the native uh, Indo-European um, lexicon, but uh, I wanted to stress uh, that uh, more, even more uh, probab uh, probative power has morphological grammatical inventory. Uh, okay, just uh, before uh, uh, I, I would please proceed, just want to make sure whether you can hear and understand uh, me uh, well, uh, or am I speaking uh, um, uh, normally, I mean, you can hear me, you can understand me, it's not fast. I'm not talking too, too fast. It's Everything okay, we can, follow you. we can follow you very well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, then, then I proceed and uh, also one uh, technical thing. Uh, please, if you would have any important technical small question, do not hesitate to interrupt me. Some lectures, it's, it's okay, it's up to the lecturer, right? So we can say that, so let me finish and then you can ask questions. Of course, b major questions can be left for the later, for the, uh, after the lecture. But now, um, uh, please feel free to interrupt me if you would have small technical important questions, just to clarify some detail, uh, so which will make you easier to follow the continuation. So um, I hope um, you will do that if there will be necessity. Uh, okay. Um, so this is a verbal root, beher, in Indo-European. We put asterisk because, because we reconstruct this. Indo-European language family uh, existed until fourth or third millennia before common era, BC. Uh, this, this means five or six thousand years ago that this dispersal happened. Uh, and we did not have Indo-European texts this, uh, because it's too ancient period. There were no uh, historical documents that time. 
Uh, that's why we study Sanskrit, our Western language, Hittite, Gothic, Armenian, Tocadian, etc. So the linguists study all these Indo-European languages and they reconstruct in strict scientific methods, uh, reconstruct the old uh, protoforms of the language. Okay, so you surely know the Greek, uh, sorry, English word for uh, bringing to bear, which means to bring, to bear, etc. Uh, in Armenian, it is berem, that means I bring, I carry, I bear, etc. Uh, Sanskrit baharami, which means the same thing. Latin ferro, Greek pero, etc. So all these, there are many of uh, descendants of this uh, verb in different languages, but of course, I keep it simple. I mentioned only a couple of such examples. So this is the present. You see, Armenian berem means I am bringing. Sanskrit baharami means the same thing. I am bringing. So why I am stressing? Because you see the deep grammatical uh, seriousness. So not only the rule, uh, that the root is concerned here, but also morphological inventory, because the first person singular form is m in Armenian and m also in Sanskrit, and also in other languages, as we will see in a couple of minutes. Right? So this is the present paradigm, only the first person, but we will see that the same is also with the second and third and other cases. Okay, so we have here a grammatical and morphological serious thing. So the same tense form that is present form, berem and barami in Armenian and in Sanskrit, it is the same, of the same origin. The only thing is that you can see that we have the vowel e in Armenian, in Greek, in Latin, and as we'll see later in other languages, because these languages keep old A e intact without changes. But Indo-Iranian languages, they have different roots. So again, any language has its root, its life, its history. So you, you can't say why uh, this change happened in this and that languages, but not in the others. It, we record what has happened. But uh, we need to be methodologically precise and we describe um, uh, in a very precise way. And then we uh, discern and describe phonological rules. So according to one of these basic rules, Indo-European vowel A always becomes A in Indic and in Iranian branches. Actually, Indo-Iranian was one major branch. So A, A, O, all these three languages merge into one A vowel, uh, sorry, um, all these three uh, vowels merged into one uh, vowel A in Indo-Iranian languages. So we have seen the present, and now we go to past tense. In Indo-European, we call aorist. Of course, uh, grammatically, this is uh, different from Turkish aorist, but this is a matter of uh, just uh, traditional use of uh, grammatical terms. So don't pay attention to this. This is what Indo-European linguistics um, uses. Uh, so the past or preterite or aorist tense makes this form in Indo-European languages. A, which is a grammatical prefix, which means past tense, ber is the root, and et is the third singular ending. The first one would be again with m, m, eberem or eberet. So we can see that from here we have Armenian eber. So you see, present is berem, I am bringing, like Sanskrit, baharami, I am bringing. But the past tense is eber with the loss of final vowel, because this is the fate of the Armenian language. The final vowel in Proto Armenian was not accented and it was always lost. So this is the issue of the Armenian, not other languages. Every language, once again, has its own fate, its, uh, its own historical development and phonological rules. 
Uh, okay, so in Sanskrit, you see, Abharat. Uh, I hope you discern immediately that again, all the A vowel forms change to A in Sanskrit. And this is phonologically regular for Indo-Iranian language branch. And Greek has the same A original vowels like Armenian, but again, like we saw there, uh, do you remember? We have been here discussing uh, that the, just a second, um, excuse me. Uh, yes, that uh, the original uh, voiced aspirated uh, sounds all become the, but the G in Indo-European languages, but in Greek, they, lo they, lost, uh, they lost their uh, voice and they become aspirated uh, voiceless. T. You see, instead of the, Greek has t. Not only here, but also here and in many other such examples. But of course, we don't have the time to show all of them. Of course. Uh, okay, so here again, we have completely regular grammatical thing. E pere, the final t dropped in Greek. Not in Sanskrit, but it dropped in Greek. And the final syllable dropped in Armenian um, completely. But the rest you can see is impeccable. So present tense formation versus past tense formation. So this is to show, to demonstrate again, that not only basic vocabulary, but also morphological inventory is seriously from the same common origin. Uh, let's have a look to the complete paradigm of these present forms in some of, not all of them, but of course, but because uh, again, I just want to make it simple. So I've chosen some of these uh, languages in the European branches, and you can see here Armenian berem, beres, bere, and Sanskrit baharami, baharasi, baharati. So it, it can be observed immediately that this is a wonderful morphological correspondence, systematical correspondence. So the first person, m, here and here, s, here and here, and, and also in Slavic. Uh, here we have some other issues. We cannot cover all of them, of course, but you see the second also in Greek and in Gothic, we, 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 have, we have s. So you see beres, in Sanskrit, Barasi, in Greek, Fereis, Gothic, Bairis, Old Church Slavonic, Beres, S became Sh because of some Slavic, inner Slavic development, but S and Sh are very close to each other, right? Then we have the third person, T, uh, and you surely notice that T again is lost in uh, intervocalic position between vowels. Because a couple of minutes ago, we have seen the word for mother, mater, right? And in Armenian, it became mair. So between two vowels, t is lost in Armenian. And this is what we see also uh, in this grammatical form. In proto Armenian, it was beredi and it became berei. So berem, beres, berei. Baram, barami, barasi, barai, bra, barati. And also here you can see Gothic Pairis second and Bairit. So this is a kind of um, uh, sibilant the, the in Gothic. And in Old Church Slavonic, Beriot again with the. You see? So the morphological agreement is just perfect. The same concerns also the plural forms and we don't uh, lose any time. And um, if you have any doubts, then we can talk about that. Please don't hesitate asking questions. But uh, so I hope this is a very lucid, very transparent example, which shows an impeccable uh, origin, a common origin of all these Indo-European languages. Another very important uh, verb is um, one of the most important verbs, actually, 
uh, in practically all the languages, the auxiliary uh, verb, or we can say the being verb, the verb which means to be, to exist, etc. So you see, the Armenian is M, Hittite is Esmi, Sanskrit is Asmi, Greek is Amy, Latin is Sum, Gothic is Im, and Old Church Slavonic is Yesm. You can see only super minor developments, which are different from, which can differ from language to uh, the other language. But you, uh, you see that they are really very, very slight and because the, the whole system is really impeccable. There is a phonological rule according to which in some languages S becomes weak, it's assimilated and then it, uh, it, is, it gives either her or then eventually it is lost. We will see in a couple of minutes some very important and very clear examples. But this is seen also here. You see in Greek, in Armenian, uh, I didn't mention here uh, Avestan, Iranian, but uh, uh, please be sure that uh, Avestan, Ahmi, etc. And uh, also, uh, I suppose some of you uh, know some Persian. Uh, so uh, also the Persian paradigm still continues this loss of S. So, so this is a really uh, very plain, very trivial thing that in some languages uh, disappears. So it happens in Armenian, but you see M, S, E, all these endings perfectly correspond to each other in other languages. Me, C, T, every day, everywhere. So in Hittite, T becomes C, again, in secondary way. Sanskrit asks me, again, A, we see, right? We, we saw um, A becomes A, right, in Indo-Iranian. So instead of S, me, regularly as me, as si, as ti, etc. And Greek, very transparent, you see, also Latin, also Gothic, im is east. So you see m, s, e, and im is east. So everything is just perfect. <clears throat> um, a few words about the gender. Armenian has no gender. Uh, by the way, it also uh, does not have a dual, for example, dual grammatical category. Uh, you surely know what dual is. Uh, uh, languages can have not only singular and plural, but uh, many of them, not all of them, of course, but uh, many of them have also dual. Proto-Indo-European lang language had certainly a dual category. Uh, so dual means um, words which almost always or usually appears in our life in uh, doublet forms, in pairs, in two uh, couples, like hands, uh, just uh, many uh, body parts, mainly. Uh, so they always occur uh, with, uh, with the two number, right? Uh, eyes, cheeks, uh, ears, uh, hands, feet, legs, knees, etc., etc. So for this category, there was this dual, which was lost in Armenian, but uh, in some cases, we see traces of this uh, original thing. Uh, but also gender. Classical Armenian does not have gender, but Proto-Indo-European Proto -European mother language did have uh, masculine, feminine, and neuter. And many Indo-European languages still preserve that. Sanskrit, Avestan, Greek, Gothic, etc. Uh, Armenian lost gender, but in several very curious things, it preserves uh, traces of gender. Like here, we can see that budno was in the European word for with O stem, masculine. So with, um, and we see that it belongs to masculine. So it's, in Sanskrit, it is masculine and also in other languages. And Armenian has undoomed bottomless word for this one. It means bottom and privative is unbudna, so bottomless. And Armenian undoomed 
follows or uh, declension class. The other one is feminine, and feminines can have either E or EA a declension. And Yerking was feminine, and it is it belongs to E stem, English I stem, but I uh, spell phonologically. And Anderk is a wonderful word, uh, which was neuter in Indo-European. You can see Greek entera, the singular form was enteron. And neuters have uh, plural in a, the second laryngeal, which gives a, right? So enteron, singular, but entera, plural. Only neuters have this a plural marker. And in Armenian, again, it's not underots, like this would be, it's not underids or underats, we would, which would uh, point to feminine gender, but it is underats uh, because the word is neuter and it has uh, a as plural marker. Okay, this uh, was a, uh, grammatical, another piece of uh, morphology. Uh, then uh, we close this uh, part of the um, uh, introduction about the historical um, origin of uh, Armenian language. And uh, I would make a short stop here and ask whether you have uh, questions or not. Um, no Hojam, I, I've got a question. Yes, mm -hmm. I, um, I'm listening. Okay, so it is very rare that we um, know the exact, almost exact time when a script is created and on the creators um, who developed an alphabet. Can you give some historical background to as to why uh, Mesrop Mashtot needed to create this script and how this relates to um, uh, the Christianization of um, the Armenian people. Mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, this have a direct uh, relation with the Christianization of the Armenians uh, because Mesrop Mashtots um, was very much concerned about the fact that Christianity was adopted, but the ordinary people, the, um, the simple people, villagers, or just uh, uh, the basic population, they could not understand the liturgy and uh, religious texts, uh, ceremonies, uh, religious books, etc. Uh, all this literature was in Greek and in um, Syriac. And Armenian people, they just went to liturgies, to ceremonies, and did not understand a word of these ceremonies. Uh, and Mesrov Martos was uh, concerned about this. And um, of course, we can put this uh, in a larger uh, framework. Uh, but the, the, the core of this uh, simplified picture is the uh, adaptation of the religious language to the people so that people can follow uh, the ceremonies, that uh, they can um, even read the religious text, etc. So the basic concern uh, about the invention of the alphabet was uh, this one. So this uh, religious um, point of departure. In other cases, we don't know who is the, the author of um, uh, the, the written traditions. In, in the case of Gothic, for example, of course we know it's a Wulfila, uh, and uh, in many others, uh, more or less uh, recent or younger uh, scripts, uh, we, we know these uh, names of the inventors, like Kirill and Methodi in the case of Slavic. Uh, but in ancient um, cases, we, we, we don't know how this happened and who invented And This is understandable that because uh, they, uh, the, um, the, the original uh, period of these traditions, are very deep in, in the time um, 
so they belong to the first, first most of the languages, the invention of uh, written systems of most of these languages uh, come from the beginning of first millennium before common era or even earlier, second millennium. So we can understand that uh, such an information is not preserved. But in the case of Armenian, so this is it. We, we know because the historical sources uh, narrate about the, uh, the whole story, how the Armenian alphabet was invented. Uh, not only the fifth century author Koryun, who was the, the author of um, the biography of Mesrob Mashtots, but also other uh, famous historians like Mesrob Mashtots, uh, excuse me, like Moses Horinazi, uh, father of Armenian historians, as we uh, usually say, or Hazar Parpetsi and uh, some others. So I hope uh, this was sufficient for your question. Thank you, Ajam. So um, we've got a question. Do you want to here? Yeah, sure. Um, Hello, Professor Martirosian. Uh, hello, hello. I'm uh, here. My, I'm listening. Uh, my question is about the uh, Iranic influences on Armenian alphabet. If, is there any? Uh, for example, is there any influence of Avestan or any other alphabet that has been used by Iranic speakers on Armenian alphabet? Uh, no, actually, um, we Armenian had a lot of um, a huge influence from Iranian languages starting from the so-called Arshakuni Arsasid uh, period, uh, 3rd century uh, BC. Um, so as far as the language, as a, even as a system is concerned, uh, we have huge influence uh, from uh, Iranian. But of course, ne next to this, the uh, Armenian uh, native core has been preserved uh, and developed uh, together with these uh, other uh, borrowed lexicons. But um, as far as the shapes of uh, characters, uh, letters are concerned, so there is no discernible uh, relation between this uh, script and the Armenian ones. Uh, there is a huge debate about the origin of the Armenian uh, letters that actually the, I'm talking about the shape, of course, of the letters, but uh, there is not a single and very probative theory which would uh, explain uh, resemblance of uh, all uh, letters to a certain uh, script system systematically. Uh, sometimes people speak about the resemblance between Armenian and Ethiopian uh, script system, for example. Uh, of course, there is a certain uh, resemblance and we can also talk about uh, early Christian uh, common cultural background and uh, many interesting things can be recovered. Uh, but actually, we don't see any systematical uh, correspondence between these uh, characters because um, if there is some systematical way of, uh, compar of comparing two written systems, then there should be, uh, the comparison should be based on two criteria, the shape and uh, the content. That is the phoneme and corresponding um, character. But in neither in the case of Ethiopian nor in any other uh, traditional systems, uh, there is no uh, such two plant systematical uh, correspond, uh, correspondence sets that can say that uh, we have a certain this direction. Uh, so Mr. Martots uh, tried to uh, make the shapes of the Armenian letters as uh, original and uh, purely uh, ascribed to the Armenian, to the native tradition. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of uh, my lecture, of course, the, this pertains only to the order, uh, sorry, to the shape of the letters, but the order betrays, of course, Greek prototype, because we have in Greek, A, B, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, Zeta, etc., etc. right? And in Armenian, we have the same order, and this is not a chance because uh, Mesrob Martots and uh, early Armenian Christian uh, tradition followed Greek one, sometimes also uh, Syriac one. And uh, whenever, as soon as the Armenian 
alphabet was invented, uh, they immediately started to translate the Bible from Peshitta first, but then uh, systematically from uh, Greek. Uh, so uh, this was uh, a bit uh, elaborated answer to your uh, question. And uh, so because the, the, the thing is not, things are not uh, very simple here, but uh, there are certain simple things. Uh, one certain thing is that Armenian uh, written culture is pre-Christian and it was invented for these concerns. Uh, then the shapes are independent of any Iranian or any other written systems. Some of them can be uh, resemble re uh, can resemble each other, of course, but there is no systematic thing. And uh, so the Armenian letters are original. They, their shape um, is uh, confined only to the Armenian written system as a system, of course. Um, and uh, the final thing uh, to cover again is that um, the or order again was the Greek one. So the order of uh, alphabet letters. But the uh, Iranian influence is uh, concerns uh, the language, but not the uh, written system. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other question for now? Uh, some of them don't have their sign. Uh, hello, Rajam, can you hear me? Hello, uh, hello. yes, I, I'm hearing you. Mm, please. I have a question about the, um, uh, the Armenian language's uh, position on the uh, Indo-European family. Are there any discussions about uh, which uh, in the, uh, which language family Armenian falls into? Like, for instance, does anybody claim Armenian falls into the hurro uh, language family? Uh, is there anything certain about this? Uh -huh. uh, Urartian, you mentioned Urartian, right? Yes. Um, uh, thank you for the interesting question. Um, Ar Armenian is not um, identical or closely related to Urartian language. Uh, there are uh, several um, uh, such attempts, but uh, actually uh, we, we don't know uh, very much uh, about the Urartian language, but still uh, some core information um, we do have. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, practically clear that it's different language. Uh, and uh, also Urartian belongs to a language family of which we know very little, and another member of this family would be Hurian. So we can speak about Huro Urartian language family. Uh, I think, uh, just a second, I think I mentioned this also in my. Um, uh, yes, here. You see, with Violet, Huro Urartian language family. So I placed it here south from. Lake Van, right? Because Hurian and uh, Urartian uh, are um, historically present in these te uh, territories, the southernmost uh, regions of uh, Armenian highland, um, and uh, even farther to Cilician region and uh, to adjacent territories. So Indo-European language family must have belonged to others language families, of course, because uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, uh, no single language starts from zero. Uh, so if we can reconstruct Indo-European proto-language by systematically comparing uh, all the branch data, that is Armenian, Sanskrit, Greek, Germanic, uh, Slavic, Baltic, etc., etc., etc. Uh, then we come to a certain point. Uh, let, let me put it because this is uh, of major importance. Let me um, explain it by uh, on the whiteboard. Just a second.
Okay. Um, let me open a whiteboard. Uh, excuse me. Um, Yes, you can see my whiteboard, right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, if this is I'm sorry, uh, my position on the table is not very convenient, so it's it's not very uh, beautiful, but uh, it doesn't matter, I hope. Uh, okay, uh, so if we have uh, Armenian here, Armenian, this is the time scale. Uh, so this is the beginning of our era. This, so this is first millennium, this is the second one, and this is the start of our uh, era. And then uh, we start counting from BC, right? So this is the first millennium before Christ or before common era, second, third. And here somewhere, Proto-Indo-European language started to collapse. And then from this point of view, we have independent origin of Armenian. Five or five or six thousand years. But Indo-European proto-language did not start from this point. It existed also before, and in earlier period, it was related to other language families. And actually, it uh, it's, it must have started from a single, um, not not even grandmother, but even grand grand grandmother language situation. And uh, so this proto 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 grandmother language must have split within tens of thousand years uh, different language families and one of these branches was indo-european right so we call this nostratic theory although uh, there are also some other views about the nature of this theory uh, and uh, in urarti huro urartian huro urartian language family was one of uh, these many language families, and uh, it was probably spoken um, several thousand years ago in the uh, in the territory which I uh, just uh, showed. So, uh, and it may be related with Indo-European uh, and with or Semitic or some other uh, uh, language families, but uh, it's diff very difficult to prove because it's even huge step these five, six thousand years that we reconstruct because we have written testimony only in the last periods, in the historical periods, right? Uh, right? Um, there is this huge area where we don't have historical document, but we just have method of language reconstruction. So we systematically uh, compare all the language data and we reconstruct a Proto-Indo-European language family. So this is uh, already very tough. But what about uh, other uh, languages? Uh, what, what about other um, uh, language families which do not have even uh, written culture? And they, so it's it's even it's it's even uh, even more difficult to uh, reconstruct, right? Uh, so that's why uh, that's why the the simple answer for that complicated question is that. Uh, Armenian and this largely spoken Indo-European language family must have had relations with other language families. Uh, now uh, scholars uh, usually talk about um, Finno-Ugric language family and some scholars even reconstruct uh, Indo-European and uh, Uralic language family. But even this must have had uh, even longer, uh, even earlier ancestral form. And again, coming back to uh, Hurian and Turartian, uh, it's, uh, so this language family may have been closer to Indo-European, but now it's very difficult to 
uh, considered as proven. Uh, as for the historical development uh, relations between Armenian and uh, Hurrian, we will come to this point later in my PowerPoint. Uh, because uh, so far, I was talking about the uh, deeper relations between Indo-European and uh, huro urartian not Urartian, not Hurrian, as they are attested in the context of Middle East in their uniform sources. But uh, I'm talking about the uh, ancestral forms of these uh, language families. Of course, this pertains this um, older periods, uh, but later, uh, starting with nine or eight century before Common Era, uh, Urartian was uh, situated in the Armenian highlands, um, and, and uh, starting from that period, there, there were some linguistic relations between Armenian and Urartian. But Proto-Armenians were present a little bit northern to these central parts, even earlier. So I will come to that point a bit later. All right, thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, do we have any questions before the break? Okay, Hujam, um, let's, let's take a break now. Okay. Uh, uh, we start at um, four in Berlin time and five for us. Um, is it okay for you? Like 13 uh, minutes from now. Uh, 13, 15 minutes from now, yes. I am yes. in Leiden, but it doesn't matter. So it's uh, Holland, it's the same time, of course. Uh, so now it's 10 to four in Leiden time. Okay. Uh, that means uh, in 12 minutes, you mean, or? Yes, in 12 minutes, 10 to okay. 12. Okay, okay. then, then we start uh, at sharp uh, in 12 minutes. Okay. Okay, see you then. See you, John. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so before moving to our next subject, we've got a question um, for, um, that relates to our previous um, uh, topic. Uh, the question is about what is called the Armenian hypothesis, the hypothesis that the um, Proto-Indo-European uh, language was spoken in the Armenian highlands in um, the third and fourth millennia BC. Uh, what is the... Um, um, academic consensus on this um, hypothesis um, nowadays and also in relation to this question um, what is the relation with the early Armenian with the uh, other now, ex now extinct Anatolian um, branches uh, members of Anatolian branches of uh, mm -hmm. members of the Anatolian branch of the uh, Indo-European language languages such as um, Hittite and Luwian uh, do we have any um, examples of um, um, loan words, borrowings, and um, <clears throat> and can you answer to this question in relate in, relate, uh, in relation to the Armenian hypothesis? Uh, of course, uh, the the first one, if I understood correctly or if I heard correctly, uh, it's the uh, how can we locate um, Proto-Armenians in the neighborhood of uh, or in the, uh, in the Armenian highland, right? This and in the European migration problems and uh, homeland and the relationship between Armenian and um, Anatolian branch, etc. All these questions uh, actually make the uh, material of my second talk. So they are they are already in the theme of what I was going to talk. Right. So uh, I will start uh, from uh, just here. Uh, okay. and, uh, and, and I hope all the questions you addressed, they will be um, touched upon in this second part. Uh, okay, so I thought uh, I already shared, but no, apparently not, right? I didn't share no, the no, no. Uh, screen. Yes, just a second. Mm -hmm. um, I'm having... Okay, now you can see, right? Yes, yes, we can see. <clears throat> uh, to address all these questions um, in right order, I would suggest start from this map. 
Uh, so as I said earlier, there is this issue of uh, Indo-European homeland. Uh, that, that is because we already saw that uh, Indo-European languages are spread in a huge territory. So all these parts of Eurasia. But uh, of course, in prehistorical times, they were not um, occupying such a vast area, such a huge area. Uh, some location must be traced back as an uh, Indo-European high mat, that is a uh, homeland uh, location, from where they, uh, the different branches uh, should have started their uh, movements, migrations, etc. cetera. Uh, so there are several theories. You can see here uh, an example, James Mallory's famous book, In Search of Indo-Europeans, 1989. So here, a, a combination of different uh, theories. And you can see that according to Gamkrelidze Ivanov, Indo-European highland was right in the Armenian, uh, uh, homeland was right in the Armenian island. Uh, according to Renfrew and later, uh, uh, Atkinson, Gray and Atkinson and some other uh, authors, the highland was uh, largely spoken in the uh, Asia Minor, that is um, in a large territory of uh, modern day uh, Turkey. Uh, and uh, I will come to the most recent developments in this theory in a, in a couple of minutes, but now the following must be said. Uh, all these theories are more or less hypothetical uh, but uh, we can say that most proponents have the theory according to which Indo-European uh, homeland was approximately in these areas. Uh, but the thing is that the recent, most recent studies, like there was also this genetic study by Lazaridis and others, uh, most of you I'm sure heard about this, uh, they uh, talk uh, about the much earlier homeland in uh, Asia Minor, that is in the territory of modern uh, Turkey and adjacent uh, areas. Uh, but uh, several millennia later, uh, through the different migrations, we come again to this region. And actually, this is the start of the uh, so-called secondary uh, migration. But this, of course, concerns a very, very early periods. That is uh, fourth millennium. So the, the last period of this second uh, wave starts somewhere between, uh, somewhere around fourth millennium BC. That is five and a half or 6,000 years ago. So this area we call, if we accept this theory, a secondary homeland, because before that, no languages were separated, probably apart from Indo, Anatol uh, excuse me, uh, Anatolian, that is uh, Hittite, Luvian uh, branch. And some scholars consider this even as a sister language to Indo-European because it was a very ancient one. Uh, and uh, so the relationship is really very complex. So if we put aside the problem of um, Anatolian branch of Indo-European, uh, then mostly we can speak about the secondary homeland uh, in this area. And from here, most probably through the Caucasus, Proto-Armenians penetrated to uh, the Armenian highland. But this happened a very early time. That is in somewhere in the Middle Bronze Age or uh, between Middle and uh, Late Bronze Age. So this means that Proto-Armenians were present uh, much earlier than the Urartian kingdom. I will come again to this point. Uh, but uh, uh, I think if we start from this theory, then uh, the most um, uh, probable route is the route through the Caucasus. This was another, this is another map in the Encyclopedia of Indo-European Culture by Mallory and Adams. 
according to which the penetration of different waves, waves of Indo-Europeans uh, would follow these vectors, these arrows. Uh, the, it's, it, this is not a place to study all the material concerning the place of Armenian and uh, also related to this, uh, the earliest uh, stages, uh, uh, elucidation of the earliest stages of uh, the history of uh, Armenian language. Uh, I just want to show the methodology and uh, refer to my uh, large paper where I discuss all these things. Uh, so I studied all the possible isoglosses, basically not all of them, but uh, most of uh, most of the well-known cases and some um, uh, through my etymologies, which are more or less uh, accepted by other scholars. And according to the, uh, to this material, we can um, we can discern one group of very important lexical and grammatical isoglosses in which we see closeness of Armenian, Greek, and Indo-Iranian branches. So based on this material, so I briefly present you some semantic domain in which we have uh, forms in which Armenian is particularly close to Sanskrit, Iranian, and Greek. Some of them, some of these words have deeper Indo-European roots, but it's very important, methodologically important, that basing on these roots, Armenian, Greek, and Indo-Iranian demonstrate dialectal affinities in that basing on uh, this and that root, they together in this dialectal union, uh, they developed new uh, innovations. And this took place somewhere in the fourth millennium BC. Uh, to give a simple example, um, which one should I pick up? Ah, well, uh, let's have a look on this. You see here, uh, Lake No, which means luminous or light uh, body or any um, fir firmament. Luminous, Lake No. We can see that it is present in Indo-Iranian and in Armenian. The word for moon or luminous strata. And it is derived from Indo-European leuko. Just to make it extra clear, let me again open the whiteboard and to show what is this about. Um, sorry. Um, I'm having an issue again with the black uh, whiteboard. Give me a second. Okay, you see now the whiteboard, right? Yes. So, we yes. So we have a um, Proto-Indo-European root for light. Leuco. From this, we have descendants in Armenian, Greek, Borto Slavic, uh, Latin, etc. So, this is a pan Indo European root, proto Indo European root, and it means light, light or as an uh, adjective luminous. So on the basis of this Indo-European root, only Armenian and in Indo-Iranian, uh, so this is the basic form of the root, right? Uh, developed a new word, a new noun with the suffix e no, and with a very specific astral meaning. So Leukeno, it gives in Armenian lucine and raochana because le becomes re in Indo Iranian uh, with the same eno suffix. Uh, so I'm talking again about this one. Uh, you see here, leuko root is 
found in the whole Indo-European language family, almost in the whole language family. But basing on this root, there was made an innovation together by Armenian and Indo-Iranian branches. Innovation by the mean of the same suffix, eno. So this means that close to the dispersal period, uh, Proto-Armenian and Proto-Indo-Iranian language forms were very close to each other because they took this step, they, they made this innovation together. So before the split of Indo-European, somewhere around fourth millennium BC, Proto-Armenian and Proto-Indo-Iranian were in the Indo-European -Euro world, they were very close to each other. They are neighbors, they were neighbors, uh, dialectal units. Uh, if, suppose uh, we, we picture Indo-European area and the population which spoke Indo-European language, uh, proto-language in this large area. So suppose this, these are all the uh, speakers of Indo-European language. Uh, but of course, there is no language which is very, very uh, uniform, right? Every language has dialects. And uh, due time, uh, dialectal differences become more and more because population always grows, increases, and the region uh, area, occupied area also becomes uh, broader and broader, and then uh, they uh, start to find new places for uh, pasture lands, uh, new agricultural uh, possibilities, etc. Or there are wars, there are conflicts, so they expand uh, and through the time and um, also simultaneously, dialectal differ differences become more and more significant because any language again has always dialects. So. Before the split, the total split and emination and migration of Indo-European language world, uh, first, dialectal differences became more and more significant. So here we could speak about dialectal union, which consisted of Proto-Armenian, so let me put it this way, P A, that is A, Proto-Armenian. And for, uh, to the West, Proto-Greek, the so Armenian was in the middle. If you imagine the, uh, the uh, map of uh, Eurasia, of course, it's uh, very, very logical that Proto-Armenian was in the mid, somewhere in the middle, Proto-Greek to the West, and Proto-Indo-Iranian to the East, Proto-Indo-Iranian. And here we have Balto Slavic branch. Here we have uh, Italic, Celtic, Germanic. Tokelian was already split, probably, or started to split. Indo, uh, sorry, um, Hittite and Luvian, that is Anatolian, uh, most probably has already split. Uh, so this is the rest of the dialectal world. And of course, Phrygian, Thracian, we don't know much about these branches, but uh, they, they were close to Proto-Armenian and Proto-Greek also. But uh, largely spoken, we are talking about Proto-Armenian, Proto-Greek, and Proto-Indo-Iranian. So there were dialectal differences already between these areas, but these three were particularly closer to each other. Then during the following periods, the differences became more and more significant and they started to um, break connections and go their own ways uh, through different areas, through millennia, through uh, centuries before they came to their historical homelands. Because we can speak about the original Indo-European homeland that is proto pre-historical homeland, and then we can speak about uh, historical homelands. The historical homeland of Armenian is, of course, Armenian uh, highland, which is the eastern part of the Asia Minor, uh, so easterly located from Anatolia. So Armenian highland, which starts roughly uh, with the Euphrates River, and uh, in northeast 
Kura River uh, in the south, as we saw already in the map, um, eastern, uh, eastern Tigris, which uh, in modern Turkish way, uh, it's called uh, Botan Su. And Xenophon clearly describes uh, the passage through this um, river. He calls it Kentrites, and this is very well known histo uh, historical uh, fact and uh, source, of course. Uh, and uh, penetrating to this um, Eastern Tigris, uh, Greek army started to be in the land of Armen Armenians, Armenoi in Greek. Before they were in Korduk land, that is Karduhoi, but after penetrating this uh, river, they uh, see it, this is south to the Lake Van. So they uh, appeared now in the land of Ar uh, Armens, right? Uh, so this is the historical homeland and here uh, Armenians were uh, even prior to Urartians. But, the, but if we discuss pre-historical uh, periods, then we are talking about the uh, Proto-Indo-European homeland. So uh, we have to make distinction between this uh, time gap and between these two levels. Okay, uh, if we go back to, uh, to our PowerPoint, uh, now I just want to make clear why we think that Proto-Armenian and Proto-Greek and Proto-Indo-Iranian were particularly close. Because we have a very large body of such evidence when we are dealing words which are confined or which are in which uh, these three branches are closer. Actually, you can see here four branches, but um, we know that Indic and Iranian formed earlier one branch. So it was Proto-Armenian, Proto-Greek, and Proto-Indo-Iranian. And later, Indo-Iranian uh, Iranian split further into Indic and Iranian forms. So. Uh, here we, you can see um, the lexical items within the semantic domain of physical world, time, space. You see here the word for uh, wave, for year, for uh, abyss, that is bottom, bottomless abyss, uh, stream, sun, air, luminous or moon, the, even so important a term, uh, such an important term as uh, uh, are the horizon sides, that is uh, east or south, purva, harav in Armenian. And then cloud, mist, stone, rock, shiny, pure. So this is only one semantic field, some group of word, words. And uh, this is another one, human, age, kinship, etc. The word for man, uh, two uh, forms of the word for old, then mortal. Also basic, very important things. And in all of them, uh, we are dealing with the uh, uh, Armeno, Greco, Indo-Iranian um, isoglos. Please have a look at the last one. This is a very, very typical, very uh, lucid case. Uh, there was this Indo-European verb mer now i'm going to open a new um just a second a new white whiteboard in proto indo european language there was this verbal root this verb mer which means to die Sorry, Professor. I have a question. A yes, of question. course. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, it's related to the uh, previous subject. Uh, so you are talking about the isoglosses between uh, the Proto-Iranian and Proto-Greek and the Proto-Armenian. Do you also think that the speakers of these Proto-languages migrated towards their current places at the same time and in the same route or not? Uh, of course, not in the same route. This is not in, uh, not possible. Uh, I will come to this point, but uh, have a look, please, in the map which I showed. Uh, so, if we start uh, with this hypothetical model, uh, which has a lot of propagators now, uh, then 
you see Indo-Iranian ru route was eastwards. You see, so this was the homeland. And from here, uh, before this uh, migration, before this movement, there was this uh, dialectal uh, union, Armenian, Greek, and Indo-Iranian, right? At a certain period, when Indo-European language family started to collapse, to disperse, and started uh, different branches of mig uh, migrations, uh, then Indo-Iranians moved eastwards. This is very certain because we have a lot of information between Indo-Iranian and Finno-Ugric language families. You see, here we have Finno-Ugric languages, right? Finnic, Estonian, later they migrated from here to the West, but the basic Finno-Ugric language family was here. And it is certain, so uh, scholars uh, discussed this already for many, many decades. There are several uh, arguings, of course, but uh, in general, uh, every, everyone accepts that there is a huge language material uh, between Indo-Iranian and Finno-Ugric languages. So this contact must have taken place here. So Indo-Iranian moved eastwards and later they spread because we know that in these areas, if we would continue the map, here is the Middle East where we have um, uh, Tajiki and then uh, in older times we had uh, East um, Iranian languages like Khorezmian, Bactrian, Sogdian, and even earlier we had Avestan, of course, which is the oldest uh, Iranian language. So uh, the language of uh, Zaratustra, right? Uh, Zoroaster. Uh, so uh, Avesta uh, is very old, uh, like Rigveda, uh, it, it, it was composed some 3000 years ago or even a bit earlier. Uh, so all this, uh, world was Iranian and also Tocharian were here uh, and so this Indo-Iranian and uh, and Indic uh, branch came this way through uh, Punjab, Kashmiri, etc. And they uh, came up to these areas. So Indo-Iranian migration was this way. Uh, the central one, Proto-Armenian, penetrated through the Caucasus and uh, Greek, of course, westerly to this area. There are, of course, other theories, um, but uh, so we don't have much time to discuss all the details, but this is uh, practically the core answer of your question. Uh, but the rest detail will come um, during my continuation, right? If, if you are satisfied so far, then I can go on, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm satisfied. I'm, I'm, I just wanted to clarify the uh, migration. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, then uh, I go on. Um, because I have two monitors, I have to always uh, do several steps before making the uh, screen bigger. Uh, okay, so uh, back to this uh, isogloss. So have a look, please, carefully here. This is pan-Indo-European world, not, ev not even proto-Indo-European, but we can say pan-Indo-European. This is present even in Hittite. And actually, this is an interesting case. In Hittite, it means disappear. Mer, the root means disappear. And, and uh, there is a theory that uh, the whole Indo-European world made um, uh, tabuistic change, it's, it's a eu, eu, euphemism, right? So because um, people in many cultures, uh, still now uh, in many traditions, uh, people find hard to pronounce the word death or to die, oh, and they uh, replace it by other um, softer forms. And in Indo-Europeans, so the word mer, which meant, uh, meant to be lost, to get lost, to disappear. Uh, the whole Indo-European other languages make the new uh, meaning to die. Okay, so the verbal root mer, which means to die, is present in the whole Indo-European world. Every Indo-European language branch, almost every language branch has this word. But on this basis, 
you see? So this is the whole Indo-European world, but on, only three branches, Armenian, Proto-Armenian, Proto-Greek and Proto-Indo-Iranian, they made they um, made a new form with to suffixation with zero grade, so called, because to is accented and it requires uh, the root become zero grade. That is the vowel becomes lost. Merto, and this means mortal, man, human being. Human. Can you see how clear and lucid this example is? So this is a very typical shared innovations. And in closer to the time of dispersal, Proto-Armenian, Proto-Greek and Proto-Indo-Iran were closer to each other and they made together this innovation. So they took one and the same suffix, to, and from the verbal stem, mer, to die, they made mr, to, which means mortal. Because in contrast with gods, humans are mortal, right? Not immortal, but mortal. And the Armenian word from this is mard, and genitive is mardo, mardoi, and which clearly reflects this original vowel. And uh, it, again, this construction is present in also in Greek and in Indo-Iranian. So this is typical. Um, Armeno Greco Indo Iranian uh, isoglos. And, and I said uh, there are many, many tens or dozens, dozens of such uh, isoglosses which are confined to Armenian, Greek, and Indo Iranian. That's why we think that this linguistic uh, evidence is important. And uh, all this material, um, they suggest that uh, really these three branches were very close to each other. And here is body, perceptions, mentality, etc. We see words again only confined to these three branches. And this is movement, speech, and other activities. Fauna, that is animal names. Uh, animal husbandry, pasturing, etc. And th this is agriculture. House, housekeeping, household implements, etc. At a later stage, we have already the absence of Indo Iranian because, as I answered uh, by uh, to the last question, Indo Iranians at a certain stage uh, were separated from this union and they went to the east between Caspian Sea and Ural Mountains and they went to uh, their further historical. Homelands. But Proto Armenian and Proto Greek stayed relatively longer in one and the same area before they would go finally apart. And so here we find many interesting glosses between Armenian and in Greek, and sometimes also in some of European branches, but mostly Armenian and Greek. You see again within different semantic domains, again, we are not going to into details to all of this uh, domain. Flora, that is plants, plant names, uh, tree names, agricultural terms. Um, you probably notice that agricultural uh, context becomes larger. So in this uh, stage, relatively younger uh, recent stage, uh, agriculture becomes more and more important because earlier pastoralism, uh, was much more widespread, but agriculture becomes more and more significant. Uh, okay, so um, because of uh, lack of time, so if, if you would like, then I can uh, come to these points uh, later, but uh, uh, I just want to uh, finish this uh, time uh, that is part of uh, the lecture by two examples of um, animal designations. Uh, Armenian esh, which means donkey, but historically it was horse. And because it was, it belonged to the poetic sacral language, which was shared by Proto-Armenian and Proto-Indo-Iranian. So this is why um, this particular case is important that there are 
uh, some uh, seven or eight such poetically or uh, sacrally marked cases. So there were two words for horse. One was Proto-Indo-European, this one, Ekvo vit palatal ke, which becomes she in Armenian. So the whole Indo-European world has this word for horse, but only Armenian and Indo-Aryan had the other one, which was poetically or sacrally marked. Why we, do, we know about this? Of course, we don't have, uh, have many pre-Christian uh, texts, only little uh, pre-Christian Armenian texts because um, our script was invented uh, relatively uh, later. But in old Indic literature, we find that this word, uh, this horse had different names. So it was called Ashva for men, for ordinary, for uh, simple people, for ordinary people, for plebeians. For, uh, uh, and it was the pan in the European word, Ashva, Esh, Armenian. But, uh, but as Haya, he carried the gods. That's why I am saying that. And so this is, of course, not my in, in, uh, invention. And this is why this uh, word is treated as a sacrally marked synonymous, which was confined only in Armenian and uh, Indo-Aryan. And the other was the simpler form for ash, for uh, horse. Uh, the other is uh, the word for panther or leopard, uh, or in Sanskrit it is lion, sinha. And in Armenian it is ins, because this palato, uh, this palato village becomes in Indo-Iranian and Sanskrit it becomes uh, and in, in Armenian it re uh, regularly gives the ins and this is a very uh, interesting term because it is found also in other Euro Eurasian languages you can see I don't want to uh, lose uh, any more time on these details but you can see the spread and uh, this is very typical and uh, the last example is uh, a very typical and very lucid compound of the word for lizard. Uh, so in Sanskrit, it is gaudha, which comes from gaudha. O is originally diphthong, gaudha. And in Armenian, it is kovdik or kovadiats. That means cow sucker, because in older times and still now in many traditions, the lizard is treated as a cow sucker. There was this really widespread uh, belief that uh, lizards uh, sucked cows. And so it's a very famous case of an old compound, go da, which comes from go di, in Armenian go di. It's the same word for lizard, but originally the same compound as cow sucker. Uh, okay, so these details I uh, just go um, quickly. And then I come to the discussion of <clears throat> so-called dragon stones or dragon stele. Uh, why we, are, we need to touch upon this theory? Because this is related to all the uh, basic issues we were talking about. Uh, again, this is the largely Armenian highlands. And here we find um, uh, historical Armenia as I showed in the beginning of our lecture. So starting with the river Euphrates. So this is the greater Armenia with these 15 historical provinces as described by Armenian historians of the fifth century AD, that is after Christ. And the same area was, um, sorry for repeating, uh, practically unchanged before the start of historical non-Armenian ancient sources, that is um, Xenophon, Herodotus, and others. Uh, because Herodotus says that um, the river Kazel Hirmak, that is Halis, starts uh, almost from the land of Armenians. And we really know that Kazel Hirmak, that is Halis, starts like this, and then it goes deeper to Anatolia and uh, Hittite kingdom was located there. So it was our Western neighbor in older times. Uh, so if we uh, 
start from the Indo-European hypothesis I uh, described above. Then Armenians, this is of course Black Sea, and here somewhere we have uh, Caspian Sea, and uh, Proto-Armenians must have penetrated to the Armenian island uh, through the Caucasus. So somewhere in the Middle Bronze Age, Proto-Armenians were close to this uh, west, uh, northern and central uh, regions of Armenian Plato. And later they developed to uh, Mush, Sasun, Harbert, Turkish Harbut, Tsopk, uh, Gorduk, etc., etc. But the original part was this. And uh, actually, we have now Ayrarat province in also in historical time, and most of it uh, is still now uh, in the territory of uh, the modern uh, Republic of Armenia. Uh, and uh, very many of the oldest um, uh, sacral and also uh, administrative centers or capitals are located in this, largely in these areas. Okay, so proto Armenian homeland was somewhere here. We can say mostly here. And what are these red um, pictures, uh, rounds, figures? These are the accumulation of so-called Vishap or dragon stones. Why these stones are important? Because they form a unique cultural tradition of making this kind of stele, uh, huge stones, sacral stones which uh, archeologists um, firmly establish uh, to belong uh, to middle and late bronze ages. That is uh, somewhere in the second half of the third millennium and the whole uh, span of second millennium um, BC. So starting from third millennium, second half of third millennium to the whole bronze age and early uh, iron age. And why is this important for Indo-European um, uh, problem. So this is why in Indo-European archaeological traditions, which are located in uh, Yamnaya, Srednistok, etc., that is north to the Caucasus, uh, there is this well well known uh, ritual which scholars, archaeologists call head and hoofs cult. According to this ritual, the sacrificed animal from uh, so uh, the, they took the skin and head apart from the sacrificed animal. So no ribs, no the body, right? Only the legs and the head of the sacrificed animal together with the combining skin, and they they had put this skin with legs and. Uh, head on top of the ritual stelae. And actually, so there is a, lit a literature here, of course, uh, all this uh, book is devoted to that. And also there are many papers uh, which I give references for. And also my paper, a large paper is devoted to this subject and it, it can be found in Academia Edu. Uh, so uh, you, uh, you see uh, these uh, stones on the, uh, high alpine um, meadows in the mountainous regions of uh, Armenia. Uh, so this is Christianized later, of course, but originally this is again, again with the head of the sacrificed oxen. So they made, they vandalized this in 11th century. They made the uh, cross uh, on the, uh, this pre-Christian uh, uh, stelae. And you see in all of them, you can see the uh, head of the sacrificed animal, which is mostly uh, ox or um, bull or oxen. And uh, on the bottom side, you see here is the bottom. You see the skin because they took away the skin, right? So it, it's a layer of the skin and the uh, hind legs. So. The top part is this one, and uh, you you can also see the uh, front legs here. You see, this is the head of the ox, and 
these are the front legs. As if so they depicted this carved uh, in the way as, as it represents the sacrificed um, bull or oxen uh, with this head and hoof cultures. Because as I said, in the fourth millennium B BC, uh, in this uh, in the European homeland area was this famous head and hoof culture ritual. The same uh, ritual is found 1,000 years later in the northern part of um, Armenian highlands. So we can see that from this northern part, from the homeland, uh, this Indo-European um, ritual penetrated through the Caucasus and it came to the northern part of Armenian highlands. You see? Uh, so, of course, there are a lot of uh, issues, discussions, and arguments, but uh, because of our time limit, I present, presented only uh, one uh, cultural issue, and there are also linguistic ones which confirm this issue, uh, which I discussed thoroughly in uh, several of my papers. Uh, and uh, we can see uh, that uh, this culture is firmly represented in this uh, northern and central parts of Armenia. So this is the another layer of this sacrificed uh, body, the, the skin of the sacrificed animal, and these are the uh, back uh, legs. So these all are on the mountains. Some of them are on the, uh, with the shape of fish, but actually they, um, the, mest, uh, the main um, topic of the in-carved picture is the sacrificed reliefic hand, head of the sacrificed um, animal and its legs. And from the mouth, stream of water is coming out. And this is related to the uh, cult of water, to fertility, et cetera. Et cetera. And we uh, keep in mind that these mountainous places were extremely important because all the sources of water, of irrigation, all start, started from uh, in these uh, regions. Even in our uh, technically developed uh, modern times, this is highly important for the uh, life circle of and, and the uh, life activities of uh, any uh, tribe or any population. But what about in Bronze Age or uh, Iron Age? So this is uh, this was really essential for. Uh, people of this uh, area. So uh, again, some issues. So uh, because um, we were talking also about the exchanging um, information uh, between our activities uh, concerning uh, hiking some summer, summer schools or this kind of activities. So I just uh, present these uh, several uh, pictures, which are also from our hiking summer schools. Uh, so this is my uh, daughter, uh, and these are this is our group, but uh, one part of the group. Uh, our group is uh, much uh, larger, and uh, so again uh, another uh, hiking uh, night in the so-called Gerama Mountains. Also um, very important, uh, Vishab Dragon Stella. Uh, two birds are depicted here. Uh, which is again an Indo-European motif because cosmic tree was marked by two birds, which in Rig Veda, in old Greek literature and elsewhere, they are uh, represented as the moon and sun. And they are uh, around the cosmic tree or the axis mundi, which is the center of universe. So some um, schematical pictures of this stella, so you can see, uh, all of them, this sacrificed animal is um, depicted without the body, the ribs, rib bones, and the rest, but only head and hoofs, exactly like in Indo-European ritual. That's why I repeat again. So this is a typical Indo-European uh, feature represented in um, starting with middle and late Bronze Ages. So one or one and a half millennia later, in this area, we find Urartu. But the Urartian was a newcomer uh, from the southern part. Uh, southern uh, regions were marked by, as I, uh, as I said um, several minutes ago, um, so they were part of uh, this Huro-Urartian language family. And uh, Hurians 
as you probably know, represent the um, uh, kingdoms of uh, Mitanni or Hanigalbat uh, of the second millennium and somewhat also earlier. Uh, but uh, so again, they are they were uh, located uh, more southwards. And Proto-Armenians came from the north, but even already before uh, Urartu, they were located and they lived already for a long time uh, here in the northern and uh, some central parts of Armenian islands. Uh, how do we know this? Partly because what I already said about Dragon Stella, but also for many, many other issues uh, like uh, linguistic evidence. And then I come to your earlier questions concerning relations between Armenian and Hittite and Armenian and Urart Urartian, etc. So let me have a look to the uh, time. So we still have some half an hour, right? So I will try to finish in 10 minutes, 10 or 12 or maximum 15 minutes. And the rest uh, of the time um, we can devote to your questions. So some uh, literature here, some selected literature, but uh, a deeper uh, linguistic uh, and also a bibliographic analysis can be found, as I said, in many my paper. So uh, before continuing, just because I mentioned our hiking summer school, um, again, uh, some pictures from this. Uh, and uh, all these uh, activities are very serious because uh, there were no lectures without handouts or uh, without PowerPoints or without anything. So it's not just coming to a uh, a highly mountainous uh, place or uh, close to inscription to talk some 15 minutes and then um, making uh, a barbecue or something. But no, this this was uh, all these years, uh, starting from 2008, we were uh, making uh, serious uh, hiking summer schools and in which we uh, did hiking, but mostly uh, also uh, having a series of lectures in particularly important locations, sometimes reading old important inscriptions on spot, not in the university, between walls, etc., but uh, in uh, the really historical uh, places or in place of excavations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So some other um, such wonderful views, uh, which with our uh, uh, lectures, uh, and this is in Lori region. Uh, from which I come. Um, so you can see uh, th this is uh, Sunik, the southern part uh, of historical Armenia, which uh, now um, uh, from neighboring countries is called Zangezur. But this is actually, I, I wrote a special paper about this. This is uh, the historical um, Zagezur, which was later um, developed to the form Zangezur. So this is a uh, part of uh, south southernmost uh, Armenian province Sunik, and uh, many our lectures were in these uh, areas and also in Artsakh or Karabakh again, uh, of course. And these are Gerama Mountains. Uh, okay, uh, so and this is again in southern part. Okay, this much about uh, our my excursus about the Armenian hiking summer school, and now about relations between Armenian and uh, other languages, um, either uh, cognate or not cognate. Because Anatolian, we all understand, right? So Armenian has a lot of borrowings. Um, just a second, I think I have this. Uh, yes, uh, let's have a look here. So the Armenian lexicon comprises three major layers. The oldest is the native Indo-European heritage. So here we are not talking about loan words. So this is all uh, our uh, native inheritance from our mother Indo-European language. So this is fifth or fourth millennia BC. Then we have uh, late Indo-European and uh, also some substrate forms. Uh, but later in already uh, historical locations, we have extremely many loan words from Caucasian, Anatolian, Hurrian, Urartian, Semitic, and especially Iranian languages. 
may I ask you a question? Uh, can anyone tell me why I marked it with different colors, Anatolian and Iranian? Yeah. Sorry? Because they are both in the European language. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Of course. Um, yes, when, uh, when we are already established in the Armenian highland, then uh, of course there are many relations with the, uh, with the neighboring languages. And these languages can be in uh, cognate that is coming also from our common mother, that is Iranian or Anatolian, but it can also be not cognate as Hurrian, Urartian, Caucasian, Semitic, etc. Right? We already lost the ties. Of course, linguists uh, study methodologically, and they are sure that Armenian, Iranian, and Anatolian are all Indo European languages. But the people cannot anymore uh, communicate to each other anymore. Uh, the Armenians could speak Iranian language, Parthian, and some of Parthians probably also understood some of Armenian. Uh, so this is true, but because they were neighbors. Uh, but uh, mutually, these languages have become already in this historical period, uh, mutually not intelligible. But uh, of course, again, the uh, core is inevitably and very, very clearly of uh, Indo-European origin. So again, this concerns Iranian and Anatolian loanwords. So they are both Indo-European languages and we already uh, lost the ties of um, the sense of being cognate, uh, but okay, so this is the way. Uh, sometimes it happens that uh, we uh, borrow from Iranian a word which we already had earlier as a native uh, inherited form, but with different phonological development. Because during millennia, uh, the phonological rules change, right? So in native terms, we have native developments, but when we are already in the recent in historical environment, and when we take borrowings from Iranian languages, then all this um, heritage has remained in the deep past. Then we take these words from Iranians uh, in, uh, in the way it looks like in Iranian, right? Okay, uh, so this is a table of borrowings uh, from Acharan's data, but of course, uh, this uh, data should be corrected. We don't have uh, much, I am working on, on all this data, of course, uh, but we go on. Um, yes, so this is the starting point. Uh, how do we know that Proto-Armenians were present uh, in the, at least in Northern and North Central parts of Armenian highlands uh, already in pre-Urartian times in uh, Middle and Late Bronze Age? Why do we know this? Uh, because of what I already told you about Dragon Stella and other things, this is one large thing. But of course, there are many, many other arguments also. Uh, next to this, uh, we come to linguistic uh, evidence. So we have, uh, there are a lot of words which proto kartvilian borrowed from older form of Armenian. Uh, of course, there are also recent young borrowings between Armenian and Georgian. Uh, in modern times, I, I mean, um, some 2000 years ago or, uh, or 1500 years ago, uh, 1500 years ago, Armenians and Georgians communicated a lot and they um, borrowed and give borrowings uh, mutually. So there are many, many uh, Armenian borrowings in Georgian and vice versa. There are also uh, Georgian borrowings into Armenian. But now we are talking about much earlier period because the word for uh, wine in Kartvelian is Gvino. It certainly comes from Proto-Armenian Gvino, uh, which is proto form of Guinea, which itself is a native um, heritage from Indo-European Voino, Vino, wine as English wine, you know, right? Uh, Greek Voinos, etc. Latin Vinum, Hittite Vian. So this was the proto-Indo-European word for wine. And Armenian inherited it, 
not borrowed again. So it's inheritance. And from Proto-Armenian, Proto-Carthilian borrowed this form. If Georgian and Laz would have the word as Guinea, then we could say that, okay, so this is a classical borrowing, some uh, one and a half or 2000 years ago. But no, so this is not Guinea in these Carthilian languages, but we know. And it is exactly what we should reconstruct for Proto-Armenian, which would be an intermediary um, location between Proto-Indo-European and classical Armenian. So that's why we think that uh, this kind of borrowings uh, betray an older, very older period, uh, somewhere uh, closer to the Caucasus, where Proto-Armenian were was very uh, much closer to Carthilian community. So it, it was already here. And, and uh, so it shows again and again that Armenians did not come recently after the fall of Urartu from um, like Phrygians from Balkan or whatever. So uh, I'm not uh, pro um, uh, propagating uh, this theory, but uh, the theory which I try to uh, develop. So the same concerns Armenian whom, uh, which is borrowed from Proto-Armenian, uh, from which Carthilian languages uh, borrowed pony. You see, if they would have whom, so it's okay, it's a recent normal borrowing, but it is um, um, intermediary uh, stage from Indo-European pond to pawn. And then it would develop to home and whom before nasal, every own develops to U in Armenian. This is a sound law, very typical to Armenian. Uh, so these are several examples, not all of them, but uh, some examples. Uh, which uh, represent this uh, older stage. Now, uh, back to your question between Armenian and Anatolian languages. Uh, the first of all, in Anatolian, uh, in Hittite texts, we find uh, the kingdom or tribal confederation, Hayasa, confederation Hayasa, uh, in the Hittite sources uh, of mid second millennium BC. And this Hayasa strongly is, rem is strongly reminiscent of the endonym of Armenians, Hai and Hayots. There are several etymologies of Hai, but it, this uh, is not our immediate uh, subject. Uh, in any case, Hai and Hayots is the uh, endonym of Armenians, and uh, it is uh, it um, possibly. Uh, identical with Hayasa, which is also uh, located to the northern and some of the central parts of historical Armenia. So also the lo location is very good. And uh, another important thing is that according to the most uh, probable, to my mind, etym deeper etymology of uh, Hai, which means Armenian, the endonym of Armenians, uh, according to this etymology, Hai derives from Hayos, and actually Hayots O is really the stem of uh, Armenian name, Haik, Hayots, uh, and uh, this is compatible with the Indo European root Hayos, which means uh, workable metal, and mostly copper and also later especially iron. And you see that uh, proto-Armenians, uh, early Armenians had neighbors, uh, which are uh, mentioned by several Greek historians as our neighbors. Chalubians and Armenians are often mentioned together. And from the ethnonym of Chalubians, we have Chalubs in Greek, which means hardened iron. So this cannot be uh, a chance. So this shows that really this hike etymology of hike Hayots and Hayasa, Hittite Hayasa, uh, is uh, really very firm because uh, two ethnic neighbors demonstrate the same semantic development from, uh, from the metal designation, ethnic or, or vice versa, it doesn't matter. So the relation between ethnonym and the name for a good iron. So this, this is another important point. So 
again, there are a lot of details which I described not only in my papers, but also in uh, my um, etymological dictionary of uh, Indo-European heritage of Armenian. So here I mentioned all which I, I was talking about. So Halubians are uh, called by Greek authors, siderotectones, that is skillful in uh, making iron. And Halubians, our neighbors, are, uh, are, uh, th their name is related to Halubs, hardened iron. And it is uh, particularly interesting that uh, Plinius mentions an interesting ethnonym. Uh, well, maybe I did not mention here, but it is certainly in my papers uh, about the relationship between Armenian and Anatolian, but also in my basic book about the, etymolo the etymological dictionary of native Armenian words. So Armenohalubians, Armenohalubians. Uh, uh, so this is another confirmation that this uh, region was marked by this closeness of Halubians and Armenians, and they both were considered, this area was uh, skill, uh, famous for this skillful metal working tradition. Okay, then uh, we come to the linguistic uh, point of the discussion between Armenian and Anatolian. There are a lot of uh, interesting um, similarities, but they all are archaism. So they are not shared innovations. They cannot tell us about uh, the really dialectal closeness as we had in the case of Armenian, Greek, and Indo-Iranian. Of course, we don't have much left to uh, elaborate on this, but again, I gave already the literature, and if uh, you like, I can help also to find this, not only my uh, two basic books, but also uh, my uh, uh, almost all papers can be found in on Anatolia, uh, excuse me, um, uh, in Academia Edu site, under the name Raj Martirosian. If you have difficulties, then I can uh, send you the links. But also some, because of copyright uh, reasons, some of the papers are not put there. I could not put it, but I can internally send PDFs to uh, those of you who would be uh, interested. Okay, so these are uh, archaic archaisms between Armenian and Anatolian. Uh, but now, we go to borrowings from Anatolian languages to Armenian. In Hittite, there is this interesting word, seli and seliya, which means grain, tile, grain storage, or heap of grain. This is formally and uh, semantically uh, impeccably related to Armenian Shech. Armenian Shech is borrowed from Hittite, Selio. And um, uh, I, uh, throughout my historical grammar and also my old uh, works, I presented um, many examples and some of them are mentioned here. Uh, that uh, the sound combination resonant plus Y becomes J. Y in, uh, after re resonant becomes J. Like Onurjo becomes Anurj, Gwelio becomes Gerj, Gwenya becomes Jnj, etc. So this is a famous sound law and it cannot be doubted. So this is typical for Armenia. Uh, so this early borrowing from Hittite, Selia with the same sound development became Sherj. So this is an impeccable etymology. Then we have the interesting name Mursilis in Hittite sources, and it is borrowed in Armenian as yes, Mushel, Musher. This is La, of course, and it is clearly borrowed from Mursilis. And I gave here phonological details. Uh, the, again, again, you can find it in my uh, paper, and uh, I don't want to lose any more time on this. And so uh, there are many other examples, like one of the most significant. Uh, examples is uh, Tarvali, Greek, uh, sorry, Hittite Tarvali, which means pestle, and in Armenian it is Targal. So this is an, uh, really an impeccable uh, correspondence because V becomes G as we, we already saw in Armenian. This is a firm 
um, very well-known uh, sound law, like Arev, Areg, diver becoming tiger, etc., etc. So from Tarvali, we borrowed it as in the form Targal, with the typically Armenian development. So pestle and spoon are practically the same thing. Pestle is something to grind food, grain, right? And spoon is exactly, almost exactly the same. So they both are wooden and they derive from Indo-European word for wood. Tarvali becomes Targali. Uh, then we uh, also have some other uh, cases, but uh, we don't have uh, uh, much time anymore. Uh, so then the last uh, point would be uh, just uh, Armenian and Urartian, and then I will stop here. Uh, because uh, again, I uh, several times I mentioned that our Armenian was uh, present in the um, historical territory of um, historical Armenia, that is Armenian highlands or Armenian plateau, um, starting from pre-Urartian pre times. Uh, so this is proven by the fact that um, in Armenian, uh, there are um, many, in Urartian, there are many uh, borrowings, borrowings uh, into Urartian. Uh, excuse me, just, just a second. Ah, excuse me. Okay, uh, let's have a look here, please. Uh, like, uh, uh, again, uh, exactly like in the case of a relationship between Armenian and Kartvelian languages. So we have uh, borrowings into both directions. So from Georgian or other Kartvelian languages uh, into Armenian and vice versa, from Armenian to there. Uh, the same is also uh, in the case of Urartian. Uh, so uh, Armenian borrowed some words from Urartian, but uh, chronologically important is the other way around. So um, the borrowings from Armenian into Urartian, because these words are of Indo-European origin, so they are native Armenian words, and uh, it's not possible to um, treat them as a loan words from Urartian but vice versa. So this means that uh, the Armenian language must have been present there prior to Urartian so that Urartian newcomers borrowed them from Armenian. So you see so, uh, the examples are really many, but I presented uh, only a couple of them like uh, Urartian RCB uh, from Ar Armenian Artsubi. This is uh, um, representative of the another uh, armeno indo iranian a uh, very well-known um, uh, mythologically important item, the word for uh, eagle. And, uh, and Armenian uh, phonological correspondence is uh, impeccably native. So for this reason, uh, Artsvi is the source of Urartian Artsvi, not the, the other way around. Uh, then we have uh, Abel, Indo-European Abel, which is an Armeno uh, Greek uh, isogloss. And from this, from Proto-Armenian form, Urartian Abeli is uh, borrowed. Uh, the next we have the word for sea, Tsov, and Tsua. The word for bridge, Kamurch and Kaburzani. Then uh, what is most, uh, I could go on with these uh, borrowings, but uh, now I come to the mo uh, even more, um, even stronger cases because morphological things are uh, much, much deeper, right? So in Urartian we have may or may prohibitive particle. So this is a piece of morphological inventory uh, and it is in our, uh, borrowed from Armenian me and Armenian me is certainly an Indo-European uh, particle. You can see here from me, and Urartian is not an Indo-European language, right? You know, and I uh, mentioned it several times. It belongs to uh, Huro Urartian language family. Uh, so Indo-European me is continued in Armenian as me uh, and Sanskrit ma, again, 
A becomes R in Indo-Iranian, Greek Me, Albanian uh, Mo, uh, Tokelian Ma, etc. So this is a typical morphological thing, an Indo-European uh, particle, which is borrowed into Urartian from Proto-Armenian, of course. Then we have this um, Yew and also, meaning and also this Urartian conjunction, uh, which uh, is interpreted as Ewa, and it, it is treated as uh, borrowing from Armenian Yev. Uh, and then we have a wonderful case uh, in onomastics. Uh, there is this regional term, Tuarazini Hubi in Urartian, which is um, aerially compatible with the uh, district called Tuarats A Tap in Armenian sources. And Tuarats is a native Armenian compound um, composed of the following. Mm, just a second, because this is uh, really of considerable importance. Uh, okay, so the Armenian word is Tuar Kettle. And plus, arts, both are of Indo European origin, which means to drive, to lead. So, Tvarats, together, we have this word very well attested in uh, classical Armenian. Tvarats means uh, not shepherd, but uh, herdsman, that is, cattle herd, we, we can say. Right, um, so Tvarats, uh, so in, somewhere in the Turuberan region, west from Lake Van, we have this um, Tvarats Atap. Tvarats Atap, that is Valley of Herds. And this place name is very clearly identical geographically and also linguistically to Urartian Tuvaratsini Hubi, because this is the same area and it is Tuvarats, three syllables. This cannot be a um, chance, chance coincidence. And Armenian Tuvarats, again, uh, is of native Armenian origin. That's why it is very clear that um, U U Urartian uh, cuneiform uh, sources here again betray an underlying native Armenian place name which is really tested in classical Armenian and it was reflected in Urartian sources. Uh, so Tvaratsini Hubi is uh, here. So this is Turuberan province and Tvaratsini Hubi is, uh, Tvaratsatap in Armenian sources is here. And in Urartian sources, it's called Tvaratsini Hubi. And another uh, very important one is represented here. Uh, again, I omit uh, details and um, and here I would like to stop. Of course, uh, here we have uh, another large um, uh, major layer of the, the biggest, the largest layer of Armenian borrowed lexicon, that is uh, Iranian loanwords in Armenian. But of course, this is the subject of um, another, <laughs> another lecture, possible lecture. Or, so now I stop and I thank you for your attention. And if there are questions, then um, I would be happy to try to answer. Um, thank you very much, Ujjal. Um, You're welcome. Okay, we've got questions. Um, so, Ujjal, uh, we have, do, we have, do you have time for questions? Can, can we, uh, uh, actually, um, in, uh, usually in such cases, I, um, I'm doing my time very um, flexible, but uh, at this moment everything was planned, and in 10 minutes or maximum in 15 minutes I have to leave because uh, sharp uh, six o'clock I have an appointment in the Leiden University. But st I still have 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, we will keep we will keep it quick. Yes, please. Um, okay, I have two uh, short questions, Professor. And yes. Uh, the first one is, uh, if the Caucasus route is more uh, plausible for the proto-Armenian migrations, uh, then can we consider uh, 
Söyle ki bana soran later let's just have some more cultures as proto-Armenian speaking cultures. Uh, yes, uh, yes, of course, uh, very, very largely, and especially because uh, because we were discussing also this dragon uh, ritual, uh, the dragon stele and the uh, involved uh, ritual uh, tradition. Uh, in uh, Le Chachen Trialet um, Cemetery, sometimes we also find the same ritual. So it's not only depicted on the ritual uh, and on the dragon stones, but in several cemeteries, uh, we find uh, burials of um, uh, high persons, um, uh, like princes or uh, ch uh, chiefs of tribes, etc., uh, in which we find also um, wagons or, or chariots and also oxen, which are supposed to take them into the, the other world, right? And these uh, animals, these oxen or bulls, are represented again by uh, the pars pro toto, that is only for uh, heads and um, uh, legs. Right. So again, we see in the uh, archaeological horizon, which you mentioned, uh, also there we find uh, the same uh, thing. Of course, uh, the picture is um, if we talk about the Metzamor, uh, Shengavit, and uh, so-called Kurarax, etc., uh, the picture is much more co complicated. So we cannot uh, uh, pinpoint only one ethnic element. So this is impossible. But uh, still, uh, the large presence of an Indo-European, that is proto-Armenian element, is discernible in several layers. So, uh, and, and, of, and of course, uh, partly we should consider here also this Le uh, Chashen, Van Azor, and, and you probably know that I am from Van Azor. So Van Azor, Le Chashen, reality is uh, this uh, archaeological horizon, and uh, the answer is yes. Okay. But again, uh, but again, I would uh, avoid simplifying the picture, right? So it's a really very tough, very complex issue. Okay, thank you. My second question is about the Parthian influence on uh, Armenian language. Um, I, I, I think there are many Parthian loanwords in Armenian, and uh, our, our material on Parthian language is uh, limited. So uh, is it possible to use these Parthian loanwords in Armenian to reconstruct the uh, evolution of modern north northwestern iranic languages like kurdish and zazaki this is a this is a wonderful question uh, so special thanks for this question uh, it's not only possible but it is very important it it, it has been done um, since very uh, long time and i also do it uh, continuously i uh, dealt with uh, some of the material in uh, several uh, pages uh, several uh, uh, papers and also in my monograph, but now I am preparing. Ah, uh, apart from this, uh, I also produced a volume about the um, Armenian uh, personal names of Iranian origin. So in um, in Vienna, in Austrian Academy of Sciences, uh, I have been working for two years and uh, I produced this large uh, volume about these names of um, Iranian origin and more, uh, a large part of them is are. Uh, of course, from Parthian, but in Berlin, one and a half year, I was uh, working especially on the topic you were talking about, and now I am going to continue this uh, probably two or three more years, and uh, then it will be a complete corpus of Armeno Iranica. Uh, and uh, you are totally right. Uh, a lot of a lot of Parthian and also some other uh, dialectal Iranian older uh, forms are not attested in their uh, proper sources, but they, they are lost, but Armenians preserved them by borrowing them. Many of such terms are uh, lost there by uh, replacing with other um, words, like from Arabic, for example, in the, uh, in the time of heavy influence of Islamic influence uh, by Arabic, of course. Uh, and uh, many, many such words uh, just did not have the chance to be attested in historical sources. But in many such cases, Armenian uh, borrowed them uh, and uh, preserved them intact. And another major uh, thing is that, important thing is that uh, many of these uh, old Iranian languages do not have full vo vocalic 
uh, transliteration, right? So they mention uh, they um, mark only uh, long vowels, not the short ones. And uh, in many cases, we don't uh, know the actual uh, uh, pronunciation of the words, uh, right? Uh, and but in Armenian, in many cases, Armenian comes to clarify that. Not only the vocalism, but uh, for example, we know that uh, the older pataka in Iranian etymological pataka series became in Middle Iranian sources voiced secondarily, but Armenian borrowed them in uh, Parthian. Arshakuni or Arsacid uh, period uh, with the historical uh, Pateka form. So this is only one example, like the word for judgment or judge, data. Uh, so it's etymologically with to suffix, right? So data. And we borrowed in the, in the original form, dat, not dad, and with secondary um, voicing as in Middle Persian or in the Middle Iranian other sources, right? So. Armenian not only preserved uh, words that are absent in the Iranian sources, but also uh, formally, as far as the vocalism and some consonantal issues are concerned, uh, in some cases, it helps to reconstruct even the shape of the lost forms. Uh, so maybe I can, uh, because we, are, uh, we have some time um, limits, uh, just because uh, your question was really a good one and very uh, typical, then I uh, show uh, several of uh, my uh, pages of my PowerPoint. Uh, you see, for example, in this case, we have Mahik, which means moon, and we have also Amis, which means month, and this Indo-European, the same root, mens, was uh, it meant both month and moon, because the moon was the uh, the the time was counted by moons. So this is very important, and for this reason, the Indo-European word had two, these two meanings. So we have uh, the same Indo-European word in Armenian in two forms: a mis native Armenian word, which is in Armenian already for at least five or six thousand years, starting from the very beginning. But next to this, we have Mahik, which is certainly borrowed from Iranian, which itself is from the same Indo-European root. Uh, another uh, interesting, important are uh, these, uh, how, how to distinguish between Armenian and uh, native Armenian and uh, borrowed forms. You see Gavazan, which is, Road for driving kettle, stick for driving kettle. It consists of gav, kettle word, and az, which means to drive. So native Armenian is az, but Iranian is az. So these all are um, very well established phonological uh, developments. So uh, from gavazan, we see Iranian loan word, Gav as but native Armenian forms are kov, kettle, and ads or cow or ads to drive, right? So this is methodological uh, point of departure how to deal with all these things. Now uh, I want to uh, come again to uh, the direction of your initial question, but before that, uh, you can uh, you can see many such examples that the same Indo-European root is uh, represented in. Armenian in both native terms with different phonological treatment because they went through many millennia. So five or six millennia, therefore we treat uh, different and uh, deeper phonological trajectories, phonological developments. But in the case of uh, borrowings, it's more straightforward. So Kov and Gav, as I, uh, show there or, or here let's take an, another example because you were asking about the parthian uh, you know this ped food word becomes in uh, iranian pada and in parthian this intervocalic the so it's not anymore the but it's it's sibilant it's uh, it becomes not sibilant but it's assimilated to uh, fricative the 
and it is borrowed into Armenian as a re. So par, foot, is borrowed from Iranian av. But next to this, we have Armenian head, which is native counterpart of the same root, right? So this is really marvelous. So par is a Parthian loan words, and uh, the others also, Mariar is the festivity name of the winter solstice. So it's from Maviar, that is mid year. And the same uh, here. So this is a typical example, again, uh, into the same direction of your question. So we were talking about words which are not attested in Iranian, but they were there, right? So look here, pati frana. There was certainly such a prefix formation, patifrana, which, which uh, had the meaning of the um, uh, pati is prefix and frana is air and window is the access for air, right? So breeze and air, fresh air is coming from the window. And patuhan, Armenian patuhan comes from patifrana and in archaic dialects we have paturhan. So uh, uh, betrays the Iranian in inevitable uh, and very clear Iranian origin from Patifrana. So you see, uh, in Indo-Iranian linguistics, you would not know anything about Patifrana uh, suffixation if you don't have the knowledge from Armenian. So there, there is even, uh, I, I don't know whether we can see it in my uh, PowerPoint, but uh, this is example is so wonderful that I really want to show um, uh, in the, um, here in, in the uh, whiteboard. Uh, in Armenian, we have a word for sleep, nish. Can you see my whiteboard? Okay. And in in, the, uh, in Sanskrit, we have the word nidra. which means sleep, slumber. So exactly the same thing. Nidra and Armenian Nir cannot be related together directly. I mean, uh, if, it were, uh, if there was a common Indo-European source, then we would reconstruct it this way, Nidra. And from this, through native Armenian phonological strict rules, we would have Nirt. Because BDG becomes PTK, and then in such cases, there is an inevitable metathesis. So we would have Armenian NIRT, but we have NIR, which is unmistakably Iranian loanwords, borrowed from Iranian lost NIDRA. So this is really amazing. This is not the only such example, but it's really amazing. So among uh, many, many uh, Iranian languages, there is none preserving this Iranian word, but it did certainly exist. And everyone is convinced that it is uh, it was existent. And uh, Sanskrit is proof of that. And Ar 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 Armenian Nirs is certainly because of this uh, certainly an Iranian loan word. So this triangle, you see, this is methodologically very important triangle. So we have sister branches, right? Indic and Iranian. So next to Nidra, there must have been Iranian Nidra and phonologically very, very regularly from Nidra, we would have uh, from middle Iranian, uh, modern, uh, classical Armenian Nish. Uh, so again, an amazing example of uh, preservation of uh, such a wonderful word. In, in, uh, in the case of which the whole Iranian material is lost. So amazing, but it is the fact. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. And I will be waiting for the great corpus of Armino Iranica. Yes, I'm looking forward to presenting it to uh, all of you. And, uh, and I hope uh, it will be um, an, a good tool, so a helpful tool for all such matters. Uh, if there is one last, uh, because in four minutes I have to run uh, indeed to the university. If you have one last comment or uh, question, then I will be glad to hear that.
uh, there is none for the time being. If um, there are questions, uh, we can. Uh, I, I will um, send you um, in writing. In, yes, in yes, of course. Don't hesitate to ask any questions. So I'm open for uh, such questions and discussions, and I will be. Uh, I'm looking forward to cooperation in different ways. Maybe also later some partial, as we were discussing with you. Maybe we can do some uh, phases of uh, some stages of summer schools. Uh, who knows? Maybe we can uh, think about uh, such cooperation. Then I will be glad. But also uh, simply as uh, communicating with linguistic matters or some other matters. So uh, I will I will be. Um, happy to communicate in all these things. Um, I mean, hosting you and your summer school in here in Shirinji would be definitely fantastic. We would, we, yes, we, we it would be amazing. Uh, really? Yes, yes, it would be amazing. Uh, yeah. But for the time being, um, let's say goodbye to each other and um, right. we will meet again on Thursday, as you know, uh, and we will talk about um, etymological dictionaries and lexicography, uh, which also um, also attended by Sevan Nishanya. Okay, uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, just Hamidjan, uh, please uh, remind me uh, half day uh, before that, right? So and, and also send me the. Uh, I, uh, I assume there will be a different uh, Zoom link, right? So please send yeah. send it to yes. me. And remind me uh, one day before, please, uh, and then I'll be happy to participate at that session. Great, thank you very much, Ujam. I am okay. I'm, uh, okay, I, I thank you for your for your attention. I also thank you for your uh, interest and for your uh, active participation. And uh, good luck uh, with your summer school and other undertakings. And see you on Thursday.